very cool to see this kind of like play out. And Einstein's like pivotal role in this like young, early 30 year old being like, nah, I ain't saying. <laughs> it's like, just, just maybe, like, hear me out, everybody, hear me out. What if it's both? This is the book that we're reading from. It's a collection of papers uh, from Albert Einstein. Now, uh, the uh, cool thing about this book is that it's only from the years of <laughs> 1900 to 1909. <laughs> and this is how thick it is. So again, we're not doing a person necessarily this week. Instead, we're gonna follow an idea. And the idea is quanta and waves of light, the particle wave duality of light. How did it come about? And this is very relevant to us because we're working through Griffiths. So Griffiths is of course about, and our discussion series is of course about the Maxwell's equation. So the Maxwell's equation is interesting. Uh, it's interesting because it plays a very big role in this, the Maxwell's equations, I should say. And really we always kind of talked about light being particles up until uh, up until Newton, like Newton's big thing was, uh, you know, particles are, you know, quanta of light, or there are there are quanta of light, and we can treat them with Newtonian physics, and that has all sorts of problems that came from that, right? So then, in the 19th century, we have James Clerk Maxwell who wrote the Maxwell's equations. Now, the Maxwell's equations are cool because they are all about fields, continuous fields. Well, how do you talk about things in fields? How do you talk about fields and the electricity and magnetism as, uh, you know, things in those fields? And that is the propagation of waves through those fields. That is what the Maxwell's equations tell us is everything is fields and waves. And that did really, really well. <laughs> Newton was the first quantum Andy. True. Um, I would like to sit down and read the Anis Mirabilis papers front to back sometimes. There's a lot. Oh man, there's a lot. Uh, in this book, there's so many. <clears throat> it's cool though. But um, he has such a cool story too, because like it, his story, you know, his, 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 you know, story of genius or whatever starts in 1905, but then he just sat in the patent office for years, <laughs> like years waiting. And it's just like, it's gotta be like, a bummer to like have all these great ideas and to not know that they're great to just sort of sit there and just wait for something. Um, very interesting uh, story for sure. Yeah, so up until Newton, there was this idea that light was particles and then James Clerk Maxwell came around. He said, no, everything is the Maxwell's equations, continuous fields and wave propagation. And then after that, there was, it looked like a very good complete theory, right? Like a really good complete theory. But then there was one thing that uh, really, uh, had a major snafu in the whole plan. And that was this black body radiation. They had some weird things come out of black body radiation. Planck did a lot of work on it, this problem. And he found out that black bodies radiate energy in discretized chunks. And there was this big issue of getting these discretized chunks to work on a continuous theory. Like how do you get energy to behave discreetly when all you have is a theory of fields and waves? And this was this very, very puzzling in the early 1900s. We're gonna read from 1909 when our boy, Albert Einstein, came through and says, this is how you treat light like chunks. Planck was right this whole time. It is discrete chunks of energy known as photons. So we're gonna, we're gonna deep dive into that a little bit. Um, he, uh, the way I understand it is Planck had this idea that light was discretized waves, but he couldn't mathematically connect it to, to, clerks, to uh, James Clerk Maxwell. Why did he go with his middle name, Clerk? Uh, James Clerk Maxwell. And the, uh, the, uh, but Einstein was able to come through and do it mathematically. He presented the findings, and this is where we're getting to the reading. He presented the findings at, hold on, I'm gonna make sure I get it right. <clears throat> on the development of our views concerning the nature and constitution of radiation by Albert Einstein presented. Now this is, this is why it's different. It's presented at the session of the division of physics of the 81st meeting of German scientists and physicians in Salzburg on September 21st, 1909. Okay. Now this is the idea. This is Einstein's, he is presenting this, uh, He's presenting this 
idea, right? And uh, I think for the first time, right now, as you guys remember, this is 1909, his special relativity work was just getting accepted. He was just coming up into the world of physics and people were starting to get really like blown away with some of his ideas. And this is like the, this is one of those things that he, d he does that is like absolutely mind blowing. So uh, <clears throat> in the, in paragraph two of this, of this, uh, I'm going to kind of skip and jump around because it's kind of long, and I only want to read a few, a, few sub, a few sections of it. But uh, <clears throat> he says this in the second paragraph. However, today we must regard the ether hypothesis as an absolute standpoint. standpoint. Uh, it is even undeniable that there is an extensive group of facts conserving radiation that shows that light possesses certain fundamental properties that can be understand, understood far more readily from the standpoint of Newton's emission theory of light than from the standpoint of wave theory. So this is him talking about black body radiation. He's saying there's phenomenon that match Newton's emission theory of light more than they match Maxwell's wave, you know, Maxwell's equations, okay? And to, uh, so there, it is therefore my opinion that the next stage in development of theoretical physics will bring us a theory of light that can be understood as a kind of fusion of the wave and the emissions lights, uh, theories of light. Duality, right there, Einstein, 1909, duality. To give reason for this opinion and to show that a profound change in our views of the nature of constitution of light is imperative is the purpose of the following remark. And uh, then, so then I'm going to skip the next paragraph and go into the, uh, the following one. Um, and he says, the introduction of the electromagnetic theory brought about a simplification of the basis of theoretical optics and a reduction in the number of arbitrary hypotheses. Getting rid of parameters. Like he's, he's talking about how Maxwell made the you know, E&M theory uh, a mathematically complete theory. The old question about the almost complete. <clears throat> The old question about the direction of oscillation of polarized light became moot. The difficulties with boundary conditions at the boundary of two media were resolved by the, by the foundation of the theory. There was no longer a need for arbitrary hypothesis in order to exclude longitudinal light waves. The pressure of light, which has only recently been established experimentally, which plays such an important role in the theory of radiation, proved to be a consequence of the theory. Boom, it's like one after another of these successes that, uh, that uh, Maxwell had. I will not attempt here an exhaustive enumeration of the well-known achievements, but will rather consider a cardinal aspect in which electromagne uh, electromagnetic theory agrees with or more accurately seems to agree with the kinetic theory. Okay? Uh, and then, so now he's starting to lay down the foundations of everything. He's talking about the velocities of light and how that behaves, the velocity of everything. He, he goes off to start by saying that this is not, this theory does not exist. The, th the theory of ether, excuse me, the theory of the ether does not exist anymore. Like that's, we have enough reason to throw it away. We're done with the theory of ether. But now, what can we say about light behaving in this new terms of special relativity? Of course, Einstein's special relativity, right? He goes on to credit Lorenz for the uh, trailblazing the way that would lead ultimately to his theory of relativity. Um, and uh, then he goes on to, dis to suggest Michelson and Morley's experiment, or Michelson's experiment. He doesn't say anything about Morley. I assume it's the same one. Um, but it's the principle, you know, the principle of relativity shows up. And then he starts laying down some foundations for how light behaves in special relativity. And he goes on to say, the theory of relativity has thus changed our views on the nature of light insofar as it does not conceive of light as a sequence of states of a hypothetical medium, but rather as something having an independent existence just like matter, which that is very, very important. Like this is one of the, one of the reasons why I wanted to emphasize this paragraph that Einstein's saying. It's very important that, you, that we now have a different idea of light as a, as instead of a propagating medium or something changing in a medium that this is a form of something similar to matter it's something outside of the medium uh, background independent if you will or background dependent excuse me uh, so furthermore this theory shares with the corpuscular theory of light the characteristic feature of a transfer of inertial mass from the emitting to the absorbing body Regarding our conception of the structure of light, in particular of the distribution of energy in the irradiated space, the theory of relativity did not change anything. It is nevertheless my opinion that with respect to this aspect of the problem, we are at the threshold of not yet fully foreseeable, but nevertheless highly significant developments. 
What I shall presently say is for the most part my private opinion, or rather the result of considerations that I have not yet been sufficiently checked by others. If I nevertheless present these considerations, this should not be attributed to excessive confidence in my own views, but rather the hope, rather to the hope that I may induce one or um, another among you to concern himself with the problem in question. So that's, I mean, like you gotta love that about Einstein, about young Einstein right here. Like what's in 1909, so he's 31 years old. He's my age, okay? He's 31, 32 years old. He's m literally my age. And he's saying, I, and obviously he's way more accomplished. <laughs> Slayer, good to see you. Welcome, welcome. But he's way more accomplished and he's there and he's saying, you know, I'm not presenting this to you confidently saying that I, my ideas are correct. I'm saying really what he's saying that becomes more evident is Planck is correct, right? This idea that light is discretized is real. You should take it seriously. And this is why I'm not saying this because I think I'm overconfident in my abilities. I'm saying this because I want to encourage you to take this idea seriously. Um, very, very cool. Uh, I think there's one more paragraph I wanted to know. He goes on to lay down more mathematics. He he uh, he uses a lot of experimentations in this paper to kind of like bolster his ideas, which is really important. Again, rigor and intuition, you know, meeting at phenomenon, right? Like that's the cool part of it is he has this, in we all they all had this intuition. They all had this rigor and the intuition was going back and forth between like, the ether and you know e and m waves as as like the background or ether as the background we don't need ether anymore we now we have special relativity what is this thing that has this light propagating in it you know now einstein's saying light can be separate um <laughs> an ether pony <laughs> um awesome <laughs> so what is this thing that light b propagates in um and he he backs up a lot of this stuff with, uh, he keeps making mention of, um, of experiments. So uh, he goes on later in the paper to say, Planck's theory leads to the following conjecture. Now this is the theory that Planck has about black body radiation, about light being discretized because these radiation keeps leaving in chunks of energy. If it is really true that a radiation resonator can only assume energy values that are multiples of H uh, nu, <clears throat> then it is logical to assume that emission and absorption of radiation can take place only in quanta of this energy value. There it is. This is like laying it right on the table. On the basis of this hypothesis, the hypothesis of light quanta, can, uh, one can answer the questions raised above regarding the absorption and emission of radiation. As far as we know, the quantitative con uh, consequences of this hypothesis of light quanta are also being confirmed. The following question arises. Isn't it conceivable that Planck's formula is correct, but that nevertheless a derivation of it can be given that is not based on an assumption as horrendous looking as Planck's theory? <laughs> um, would it not be uh, possible to replace the hypothesis of light quanta by another assumption that would also fit the known phenomenon? If it is necessary to modify the elements of the theory, would it be possible to retain at least the equations for the propagation of radiation and conceive only the elementary process of emission and absorption differently than they would have been until now. So he lays that down very clearly. He's saying, I'm not saying Planck's wrong or Planck's wrong. Okay. He's saying, is there a way, I didn't want to close the book. That's annoying. Is there a way where if we were to treat light differently or excuse me, if we were to treat Planck's theory of light differently, could we talk about it as both a particle and a wave and have those two things be consistent? I think that this would have been very hard to swallow if I was a physicist sitting in the crowd, listening to this guy, this 31 year old guy or 32 year old guy, whatever, how, or 30, whatever, however old he was, um, tell me that everything that I thought about light was, you know, equally wrong up until this point. So much as to say that it was that it was right, but now I, I have to think about a new like a new idea that like light is both somehow supposed to be a particle and also a wave. I mean like that like that's like it's literally like someone's like goes to the stage and says, you know, Porque no las dos, like the the you know the uh what, the taco commercial or whatever, you know where it's like someone is like saying, 
I've always thought it was a particle, and then Maxwell came around and said, no, it's actually a wave. And then, you know, uh, Planck comes along and says, well, I'm getting this, and it says it has to be a particle. And then he, Maxwell's saying, no, I'm getting this, and it says to be a wave. And then Einstein comes along and is like, <laughs> why not both? So then everybody else in the crowd is just like, you know, whatever. But uh, that's how I would have been. But I think people, uh, I think what w might surprise you, what pe how people reacted to it. Um, and he lays down all the maths. Uh, <clears throat> He lays down all the mass in the paper. Yeah, Cosmo, I'm not going to get into the actual mass of the paper. I'm just going to tell you, again, like this is more of like a history. So uh, I don't want to get into the, the how he did it. I'd have to actually like prepare how he did it. And I didn't actually prepare that. Uh, but if you're interested, we could always do it in the future. Um, but I would probably not use this <laughs> as a reference because someone else, I'm sure, prepared it much better at a different time. Uh, and I'd have to find that. This is a little bit hard to like to follow. I'd have to spend quite a bit of work trying to prepare it step by step. Um, but again, I'm trying to, to lay out the history of how it happened. Uh, so this is the final paragraph in the lecture. It says, still, for the time being, the most natural interpretation seems to me to be that the occurrence of electromagnetic fields of light is associated with singular points, just like the occurrence of electrostatic fields according to the electron theory. It is not out of the question that in such a theory, the entire energy of the electromagnetic field might be viewed as localized in these singularities, exactly like the old theory of action at a distance. Uh, <clears throat> I more or less imagine each such singular point of being surrounded by a field of force, which has essentially the character of a plane wave whose amplitude decreases with the distance from a singular point. Uh, I am sure... It need not be particularly emphasized that no importance should be attached to such a picture as long as it has not led to an exact theory. All I want is briefly to indicate with its help that the two structural properties, the undulatory structure and the quantum structure, simultaneously displayed by radiation according to the Planck formula, should not be considered as mutually incompatible. So this is very cool. I was going to read more, but I'm probably not going to because it's going to be a little bit lengthier. Um, here's the, here's the, the takeaway from the lecture is that Einstein's laying down some of the groundwork, some of the mathematics, the baseline. But at no point does he say, you know, <clears throat> I don't, at least when I was reading it, I didn't find like the step-by-step -step start here and solve it this way. And he even says very, very conservatively that I'm not trying to prove anything. I'm trying to get you guys thinking that this is the way that it could be. And that we should start investigating this as, you know, a reality. And uh, Planck's remarks afterwards, the remarks are in here as well. I can post them in Discord if you want, but the remarks are in here as well. And he says some very interesting stuff. He very much thinks that he agrees with Einstein. He's a little bit hesitant about going on to the wave theory idea. But he thinks, and it's kind of cool as well, because then he starts talking about quantum and how quantum behaves. And this is 1909. This is like before the major progress was made in quantum theory. And it's very cool, uh, basically, their interactions. And then there's a couple other people, Stark and Rubens, who chime in. And they're... And as far as I know, Stark uh, seems to be, there's a lot of tension when you're reading this uh, between the, the different physicists. And then finally, Einstein chimes in at the very end. Uh, and he just basically says, like, hey, like, we did it before with molecules. We found that molecules are smaller in atoms. We can do it again with this. And he's like, there's, there's always going to be um, this idea that we can break it down into smaller constituents, we can look at it through a different guise, and that these things may, may look different. So here's the thing, is like this is what they were doing back in 1909. They were just getting this idea that there exist these small quantum particles. In the beginning of the 1900s, in 1909, uh, <clears throat> you could have this, they, they were trying to understand this idea that there was something smaller than even the atoms. Like there was things happening and even light, like something that moves at the speed of light. How do you talk about that as a, as a discrete object? But yet they found it in experiments and they were trying to explain it. And like this was the, like this was like the birth of quantum mechanics is, is what Planck did with discretizing light. And then later on, it would come in, uh, the Heisenberg and the Schrodingers would come in, and then Dirac would come in and like start furthering along quantum theory into something that was you know, attainable and usable. Very cool to see this kind of like play out. And Einstein's like pivotal role in this like young, early 30-year-old being like, nah, I ain't saying. <laughs> it's like, just, just maybe, like, hear me out, everybody. Hear me out. What if it's both? <laughs> and I think that's really cool that Einstein would take that like that approach to this problem. Um, 
really, really interesting and it gives you perspective. So I have a question. I have a question for you before. There we go. There's the push-ups. I have a question to you before we end this, the topic. And that is, what is, in 2021, what is the current quantum, th quantum theory being developed? Uh, so what exists now that we're studying in 2021, where are we are kind of like muddling around with some ideas and everybody's kind of like disagreeing with each other. We're at each other's throats and you know, we're kind of like thinking about like, you know, I'm disagreeing and you're disagreeing or like that. Like what is, what are you guys' thoughts on this? I'm very LQC and strings is one thing that it's the, you know, the continuous versus discrete versus loop quantum gravity versus strings. Is it the same thing, Admiral Entropy? I mean, there are people, Admiral Entropy has a really good point. There are people who stand up right now and are like, maybe they're the same thing. <laughs>